There was anticipation in Iowa about what the coming decade would hold, as there were only a few weeks remaining in 1979. With the expansion of equal rights and the advent of daring fashion trends, the 1970s had been a lively decade for the state. Michelle Martinko, a senior in high school, embodied what it meant to be a teenager at that time with her blonde hair pulled back and her fashion-forward looks. The 18-year-old was always up for trying anything new and had a promising future. She lived in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, together with her parents, Albert and Janet, and her older sister, Janelle. Michelle was often referred to as a miracle child because her parents had her 14 years after her elder sister, Janelle, was born. Her parents, Albert and Janet, had undergone series of miscarriages before she came into their lives. For this fact, Michelle was pampered and enjoyed the luxury of having everything she wanted. Michelle Martinko attended Kennedy High School, where she excelled academically and was well-liked. She had been a choir singer and a cheery member of the twirling team. She also participated in theatrical plays and intended to enroll in Iowa State University where she could study interior design. On the evening of December 19, 1979, Michelle went to a choir supper at a local hotel. When done around 6.30 p.m., she asked Jane Hansen, a close friend and fellow twirler, to join her for a ride to the mall, but Jane rejected the offer, saying she still had schoolwork to finish. Michelle, however, drove her parents' tan 1972 Buick to the Westdale Mall, where she wanted to buy a winter coat. The mall had only been opened for two weeks, but she already adored the stores. Dressed in a black dress, black tights, heels, a waist-length white and brown fur jacket, Michelle was observed looking around and chatting with people she ran into at the mall. While at the mall, Michelle ran into a friend and confided in her that she felt she was being followed. She thought it could be because she was carrying a lot of cash with her. Her friend, however, reportedly reassured her that she didn't see anyone attempting to follow her and that she should hide her money away from the public eyes. Attempting to push the unsettling idea from her mind, Michelle finished her shopping and made her way back to her car. Unfortunately, her suspicion was right after all because someone opened the door as she was getting into her car, knocked her over, and attacked her. Michelle tried her hardest, but she was unable to physically defend herself. When Michelle's parents discovered she hadn't come back home, it was late. At two in the morning, they reported her missing to the police. Roughly two hours later, police discovered her parents' Buick parked in the northeast corner of the mall's parking lot. As they drew nearer to the car, they could see through the frosted windows that someone was slumped inside. Opening the car, they discovered Michelle curled up in the footwell of the passenger seat, covered in blood. She was dead. Michelle Martinko was discovered with around 29 stab wounds to her face and abdomen, in addition to other defensive wounds on her hands. The young teenager had lost a third of her blood. Medical examiner determined that a single stab to the heart was probably what caused her death. When the police arrived at the crime scene, they were unable to locate any other fingerprints apart from Michelle's. This suggested that the murderer was well prepared and had decided to put on gloves. Investigators surmised that the murderer's motivation was personal because no weapon was discovered at the scene and Michelle was not the victim of a robbery since her purse and cash were untouched. Due to the defensive wounds on her hands, it is believed that Michelle may have been attempting to defend herself from being sexually assaulted. However, the medical examiner concluded that she was not sexually attacked. In order to get answers and clues, the blood scrapings discovered on Michelle's car's gear shift was sent for analysis. It, however, revealed the presence of a male DNA. Additionally, the investigators had Michelle's dress tested in a lab. The male DNA profile on the gear shift and a spot of blood on Michelle's dress matched each other perfectly. Police made a request for public assistance because they had no further information. Every male Michelle knew from school was questioned, even her two ex-boyfriends who had alibis. Andy Seidel, one of Michelle's ex-boyfriends, acknowledged seeing her the night she was murdered but his alibi was sufficient to exonerate him. Cedar Rapids, 
a small town, would not, however, accept Andy Seidel's alibi as being true. They and Michelle's family strongly believed he had a hand in her death. Andy and Michelle had dated for two years before they broke up. Andy wanted commitment, but Michelle was not having any of that. According to Michelle's family, after their breakup, Andy was said to have constantly stalked Michelle, monitoring her life as well as any new relationships she must have had. At Michelle's funeral, Andy was seen holding and hugging her corpse while he cried his eyes out and asked questions like, Who did she love before she died? Was it me? This scenario further made Michelle's family and the community suspect Andy as the culprit. However, there was not enough evidence to pin him to the crime. Andy Seidel left Cedar Rapids after graduating from high school and joined the Navy. He eventually underwent a DNA test in the future, and the results did not match the suspect's evidence discovered at the crime scene. In the months following Michelle Martinko's murder, numerous leads were pursued, and hundreds of persons were questioned by the police, but they all came up empty. As her murder case dragged down, a $10,000 reward was offered to anyone who had a lead that could pinpoint the murderer. In June 1980, based on the descriptions provided by two witnesses, authorities created a composite sketch of the individual they thought was responsible for the killing. The sketch depicted a white man in his late teens or early 20s who was probably around six feet tall with dark curly hair. At first, tips came in their hundreds, then they fizzled out. In the months and years that followed, the police essentially implored the public to come forward with helpful information. Nobody had a stronger desire to see Michelle Martinko receive justice than her parents, Albert and Jeanette. As the homicide investigation stalled, Albert Martinko sued the owners and managers of Westdale Mall in the mid-1980s, alleging they had failed to provide reasonable security on the night his daughter was killed. The case was appealed all the way to the Iowa Supreme Court, where the judges decided in favor of Westdale Mall on September 17, 1986. Sadly, in 1995, Albert Martinko passed away, and in 1998, Janet Martinko followed without knowing or seeing their daughter's murderer. In subsequent years, a company that specializes in DNA phenotyping which Cedar Rapids police defined as the method of determining physical characteristics and ancestry from unidentified DNA evidence, was later patronized by the investigators. Virginia Parabon Nanolabs was able to create a portrait of a person of interest, but this didn't help anything, and by 1986, Michelle's case became cold. In the year 2006, due to improvements in technology, police were able to collect the suspect's DNA. The suspect was believed to have cut his hand at the scene of the murder, perhaps as a result of Michelle's fierce resistance. He ultimately spilled blood upon the steering wheel. The police department contacted the public once more and requested any details concerning a person who had a cut on their left hand around the same time of Michelle's murder. In the two years that followed this development, the suspect pool was further reduced by the police. When investigators entered the killer's DNA into CODIS, a database of DNA from criminals who have been arrested, no hits were found. In 2017, Virginia Parabon Nanolabs, a company which specializes in DNA phenotyping, used just DNA clues about the killer's ancestry and facial features to produce further photos of the murderer. The pictures depicted a man with blonde hair and blue eyes, and they looked very different from the composite sketch from 1980. They also created rough estimates of the suspect's age in the years following the crime. A former classmate of Michelle Martinko said in a news conference when the new image was revealed that the face resembled another of their classmates, but that classmate had been investigated and cleared based on a DNA sample years earlier. In 2018, the DNA phenotyping business utilized the information it had gathered the previous year and submitted it into GEDmatch, a genealogical database open to the public that has been used by law enforcement to crack other cold cases, most notably the one involving the Golden State Killer. One person who shared DNA markers with the murder suspect in the case of Michelle Martinko 
was found using Get Match, and it was established that she was most likely the murderer's second cousin, once removed. Four pairs of the woman's great-great-grandparents were used to build a family tree, and it was concluded that the killer was most likely a descendant from one of those couples. After speaking with members of two branches of the family tree who had undergone DNA testing, a Cedar Rapids police investigator ruled out those branches as housing the murderer. After getting in touch with someone from a third branch, a DNA test revealed that they were the killer's first cousins. As a result, the suspects were reduced to a trio of brothers who had grown up in Manchester, Iowa. Investigators started monitoring the three brothers while also making covert attempts to gather their DNA. On October 29, 2018, an investigator saw Jerry Lynn Burns, one of the brothers, consume multiple sodas using a plastic straw. The investigator then took the straw after Jerry Burns threw it away and performed a DNA test on it. Test analysis ruled out the other two brothers as suspects, but the blood found on Michelle Martinko's dress matched the DNA for Jerry Burns' straw. Investigators spoke with Jerry Burns on December 19, 2018, at his place of business in Manchester, Iowa. He was forced to comply with a search order after he refused to voluntarily supply a sample of DNA. He also had his hands and arms checked for any possible scars from the alleged attack that night. Jerry Burns insisted he didn't know Michelle and wasn't present when she was murdered, although a detective later testified that he did not directly deny killing Michelle. Jerry Burns was unable to explain why his DNA would have been found at the scene of the crime. He showed almost no emotion during the interview, even when he was eventually informed he was being arrested. He frequently instructed investigators to test the DNA when questioned if he had killed anyone that night in 1979, even though the blood sample discovered at the crime scene and his DNA was a match. Jerry Burns was detained and charged with first-degree murder on December 19, 2018, which was precisely 39 years after Michelle Martinko's death. He entered a not guilty plea. Jerry Burns was a virtual ghost. There wasn't much information available about him. In Manchester, Iowa, a town of 5,000 people located approximately an hour north of Cedar Rapids, he was best known as a respected businessman leading a quiet life. He was raised there and earned his high school diploma from West Delaware in 1972. He was married to Patricia Burns in 1975. She, however, died by suicide in 2008. Jerry Burns is the owner of Advanced Coating Concepts, a powder coating company on Manchester's south side. He was 25 years old when he killed Michelle Martinko. According to investigators, there is no proof that Burns and Martinko were acquainted. Jeff Holst, an investigator with the Cedar Rapids Police Department, was tasked with searching the suspect's computers. In Burns' office computer, Jeff Holst discovered evidence of Internet searches and activities involving blonde females, assault, rape, strangulation, murder, abuse, and rape of a deceased individual, and cannibalism. Two years later at his trial, on February 24, 2020, after three hours of deliberation, the jury convicted Jerry Lynn Burns guilty of Michelle Martinko's first-degree murder. For first-degree murder, Iowan law stipulates a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Jerry Burns' counsel submitted a motion on May 29, 2020, requesting a new trial on the grounds that the judge erred in rejecting the application to suppress the evidence and that his constitutional and state rights had been violated. Finally, on August 7, 2020, Jerry Burns was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He, however, later filed a notice of appeal in September 2020. He is incarcerated at the Anamosa State Penitentiary at the moment.